Okay, should we get started? I think it's about that time. Um, I'm not going to go the full time, just so you know. This is pretty short and sweet and to the point. Um, last time I did this, it took about a half hour rather than the full 45 minutes. So there's plenty of time for questions. If you have a question about something, just stop and ask me, okay? So we all know, um, you know, STEMI, one or more millimeters of ST elevation, two or more contiguous leads. So we've all had pounded into our heads, rush, 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 cath lab, open the artery, time is hard. So it turns out that there are a number of other EKG patterns that also, so STEMI versus NSTEMI is kind of a false dichotomy. So the definition of an MI is a rise and fall in troponin of a certain amount, which just means you have damage to myocardium. The, a STEMI is one particular EKG pattern that represents a clot in an artery that benefits from having that clot immediately reopened. But there are other EKG patterns that represent a clot in an artery that will also benefit from having that artery opened immediately. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, most none of these meet your sort of traditional millimeter criteria, but they all still need to be rushed to the cath lab to have that artery opened immediately. So tell me what you see. So you got depression in V4, V5, and V3, and V2. So. Okay, what do you think? Pericarditis. No, maybe not enough. Keep in mind what the presentation title is. <laughs> I'm, I'm not I'm not tricking you. <laughs> so this is actually an isolated posterior MI. So the reason that this looks funny is because all of our EKG leads are on the front of the chest. And when the back side of the heart is infarcted, if you had EKG leads on the back, which we do sometimes, you would see ST elevation. But because you're viewing that ST elevation from the front, it looks like ST depression. So keep this fresh in your mind. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and we're gonna flip it over and pretend like you're holding it up to the light and looking through it from the back. And watch how much more those jump out at you now. It's just because of part of your pattern recognition, the way that your brain is wired, you see ST elevation easier than you see ST depression. So when you have ST depression in the precordial leads on an EKG, even if you're like not really super sure, flip it over and hold it up to the light and your brain is just gonna pick up on those ST segment changes a lot easier. Um, this is actually, this trick has been actually validated through research and it's actually pretty good for picking up um, posterior MI. So characteristics of the posterior MI, you're going to have, so there, there's going to be ST depression throughout the cordial leads, but the ST depression is going to be maximal in V1 through V3. Rather than sort of global ischemic changes, you're going to have most of the ST depression in V5, V6. So that's one difference between the two. You're going to have ST elevation, quote unquote, when you do the flip the EKG over trick. And the other important difference is you've got this down sloping ST segment depression versus when you have global ischemic changes, you're going to have sort of up sloping ST segment depression. This maximum would be 5 v 6 um, So do the flip the EKG, maximal depression V1 through V3, and you've got that down sloping ST depression that's isolated posterior MI. So next one, tell me what you see. Okay, so there's some ST depression in V2. Okay, what else? Where else do you see ST changes? Okay, two, and two, three, and ABF. So yeah, we've got in two is not really that much appreciable, but three and ABF for sure. Yeah. So you yeah. got two contiguous leads there. Okay, we have ST depression. Right. Okay. Do you see ST elevation anywhere? Any? Um, 
yes in one. Okay, one. Anywhere else? And maybe an AVL. Maybe an AVL. It's a little hard to tell with the baseline. Yeah. If it is, it's really subtle. Yeah. yeah. So this is a high lateral MI, and it is actually the most frequently missed pattern of infarction. The reason for that is because of where the high lateral leads are, um, they tend to produce very minimal ST segment changes. So the trick here is if you see depression in 2-3 AVF, to immediately look in 1 and AVL and look for any ST elevation. Even if it's half a box, even if it's that ST segment kind of getting straight instead of being curved in. Any kind of change in the right clinical picture is going to indicate a high lateral MI. So you said if you see depression in 2-3 ADF or ABL, ABF, then yes. look in 1 and ADL. Okay. If you see depression in the inferior leads, immediately look to the high lateral leads. That needs to be a reflex. Look for any kind of change in the right clinical picture that's going to be a high lateral infarct. <clears throat> okay, tell me what you see. There is elevation, but... You've got that wide QRS, mm -hmm. so it looks like a bundle branch. Yep. So this is a left bundle branch block, which ST elevation is a normal component of. Mm -hmm. But what if someone with a left bundle branch block also has a STEMI? Well, then you're going to have to look at their symptoms, too. <laughs> <laughs> is it a clinical diagnosis, or what? Okay, so this is actually a STEMI superimposed on a left bundle branch block. Um, there are several features that are going to stand out. So, as we said, ST elevation is a normal feature of left funnel branch block. But you can also have too much of a normal thing. Yeah. So, rule for left bundles is when it's mostly negative, the ST segment should be up. When it's mostly positive, the ST segment should be down. So here, this is called a discordant change. You've got ST elevation where it's negative, which is normal, but I'll go over that it's too much of a good thing or a normal thing in just a minute. But over here, you've got mostly positive, but the ST segment is on the same side. So two things, if you've got this kind of ST segment here, or if you had ST depression here, that would also, that would also be diagnostic of the MI. So you're going to have you're going to look for concordant changes which means that the ST segment is on the same side as the QRS complex. So that's where I was saying if you have ST if you have a negative QRS like in V1 through V3, if you have ST depression, that's going to be diagnostic in MI or V5 through V6 where you should have an upright QRS complex if you have ST elevation, it's going the same direction, that's di that's always diagnostic of an MI. The new thing is this uh, proportional discordant change. So the original criteria for diagnosing STEMI in the presence of left, uh, left bundle branch block was uh, called the Scarbosa criteria. You may have heard that term thrown around. And that used an absolute number of millimeters for if you have this many millimeters of ST elevation, then it's diagnostic of MI. Turned out that that was statistically the weakest part of the Scarbosa criteria. So more recent, as in the last year or two, um, that has been researched and also validated externally is this idea of proportional discordance. So having some ST elevation is normal, but having too much is abnormal. And the cutoff is 25% of the depth of the QRS complex. So, so if the QRS complex has more than, so you take this, you look at a quarter of it, you can have that much elevation. If there's more than that, then that's too much of a normal thing and it's diagnostic of MI. We're gonna dumb this down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quarter. It it's a quarter, it's not hard. Th th that's probably the trickiest thing. It's more than 25% of yeah. the depth of the QRS depth complex. Of the QRS in a left bundle branch. Yes. Then it's an MI, then it's an MI. yes. Okay, tell me what you see. 
Okay, we've got SD depression. Anything else stand out? Got some kind of big or funky looking T waves. Okay, this is not one I'm gonna expect you guys to necessarily know off the top. This is the DeWinter ST T wave pattern. So it was originally described as, it was, it's originally described as representing about 2% of LED occlusions. So it's not infrequent. Um, in the time that I, in the four years that I worked here, and I was mostly in the ED, I actually saw it several times, um, either as an initial presentation or something that was found like on a repeat. Um, so it's not infrequent. Now, originally, the DeWinter pattern was described as there's an acute occlusion, they get this pattern, it stays that way until the artery is open again. However, there um, have been a couple recent case reports, one of which came out of here, where the DeWinter pattern evolved into a sort of obvious looking anterior STEMI. And also where an obvious looking anterior STEMI evolved into the DeWinter pattern. So that really lends to the body of evidence that this needs to be treated as a STEMI equivalent. So they're gonna have the same clinical picture, um, but they're gonna have this pattern of ST depression with a big, broad, hyperacute T wave, um, and, uh, but it's, they're not gonna meet millimeter criteria, but it's still, they need to go to the cath lab, they're gonna have an LED occlusion. So you just kinda need to beat this visual image into your head it's ST depression with a big, broad, hyperacute T wave. Questions? Equals bad. Yes. Cath lab. All these equal cath lab. <laughs> All these equal cath lab. Okay, tell me what you see. That's definitely more than 25%. But is it a left bundle branch block? What's the most eye catching feature of this EKG? That it's the T waves. So big ass, ass T waves. Yeah. Big ass T waves, right? Some, some of that discordant changes. Like ABL, right? That's it's only for a left bundle. This is not a left bundle because okay. the QRS is narrow. And then ABR, that whole sloping, wide sloping. It looks a little funky, but there's not actually any ST changes there. So, what's the differential diagnosis for big ST waves? Hyperkalemia. Okay, hyperkalemia, and probably also coronary artery occlusion. Considering the presentation, yeah. So. These are hyperacute T waves. They are one of the earliest changes that you will see after an infarct. So as people are getting more um, aware, uh, there's more sort of like the public health reaching out initiative if you have chest pain come to the ER kind of thing. If they have a recent onset of chest pain, you are more likely to see this in the pre-hospital setting. You are very likely to see this because they start having chest, they've only had chest pain for 15 minutes, they call 911, you get there, they haven't had time to produce sort of ST elevation yet. They've got these very early changes going on. So the first change that you will see with coronary artery occlusion is actually the, what will eventually be the reciprocal change. So for an anterior infarct like this, the very first thing that will happen is inferior depression. The next thing that will happen are these big hyperacute T waves. And you'll see this in patients. This will evolve into sort of the obvious looking ST elevation. But this is one of the very early findings for someone that has a very recent onset of chest pain. Did you have a question? So how does it relate to the lab value then? Do you, can you have that separate from? Like if we have the hyperkalemia and then that's kind of the, it's the striving force of the cause of the T This has nothing to do with hyperkalemia. Yeah, so if you would, like if you did an ice stat and you were looking at the potassium because you the saw normal. that you couldn't differentiate, you'd have a normal one. Correct. It was on the EKG. Correct. But if you had a high potassium with this and they weren't yes. having symptoms, then you lean more to the it's a right. So yes, um, and also the clinical picture is going to be very different. Okay. You know, I was snowed in and missed my Dallas appointment versus versus I was sh shoveling the first snow of the season out of my driveway and started having chest pain. Um, so to illustrate that difference. Um, on the right, you've got hyperkalemic T waves, and on the left, you've got uh, occlusion T waves. So you see these are more symmetrical and pointy, and these are asymmetric and kind of rounded. So there's, al there's also a morphologic difference between the two. So the hyperacute T waves are broad, 
in asymmetric. So if you cut them in half right here, it doesn't look the same on both sides, whereas the hyperkalemic T waves tend to be symmetrical. So the clinical picture, but also there is a morphologic difference between the two. Okay, what do we see? So we've got depression all over the place. Do you see elevation anywhere? In AVR. In AVR. So what do you think? Well, if you saw depression in those and scanned to AVR and saw changes at all, even if it didn't match the criteria? Or if it didn't match the height? Is this where you were saying if you look in like two and three and you see the depression? Then you look to the so ADR we, and one and you see we, so we look in one and ADL, oh. where the two, your high lateral leads. So we don't see any elevation there. So it's not a high lateral MI. So this is a tricky one. This is actually left main coronary artery insufficiency. So um, not occlusion, just partial occlusion. Right. So the, the deal with left main coronary artery occlusion, which you'll, when you talk about this pattern is frequently what people will call it, an actual acute occlusion to the left main will cause a very different EKG pattern. So the more correct um, way that you'll see it in the literature is insufficiency. So this particular EKG, so by the way, all these cases came from the emergency department here. Um, this particular EKG was from an older gentleman that was actually here for a GI bleed. Um, he was hypotensive and then started having chest pain. And so what happened was he had a tight left main and then when he got hypotensive, that dropped the coronary perfusion pressure and he started having ischemic changes. So he had left main insufficiency, but it was exacerbated by the fact that he was bleeding out. And in fact, once he was resuscitated with blood products, the EKG changes went away and his chest pain resolved. Mm -hmm. So um, this pattern, I mean, we've also, I've had a couple cases where um, a guy came in with acute chest pain and had this pattern. And you know they've got like a 99% stenosis of the left main or something. Um, the other thing is most patients, if they have a true left main occlusion, do not live long enough to produce an EKG. They they tend to just drop dead because it's just that fatal of a of a uh, pathology. So the changes you're going to see here are ST elevation and AVR, sort of diffuse ST depression everywhere, but it's going to be maximal in sort of V5 V6. The caveat to this is that this is the same pattern that you will see with sort of global ischemic changes. So if someone is in rapid AFib, they'll have these kind of changes because they're having demand ischemia because they don't have enough diastolic filling time to perfuse their own heart. If someone is in SVT, they'll have these kind of EKG changes. You've probably seen like some people when they're in SVT, they're gonna like, or after you convert them, they get the EKG and they've got some kind of like funky looking ST depressions. It's not because they have coronary artery disease, it's because their heart's been going at 190 for the last hour. So yeah, it's a little ischemic. Um, and so you're gonna see this same pattern, but the difference is, number one, the clinical picture. So um, you've got an arrhythmic event, and then you've got these changes that occur afterward that will resolve within minutes. So if someone's in rapid AFib, they have some kind of funky EKG changes, you give them beta blocker, or calcium channel blocker, or whatever, to give them rate control, those EKG changes should correct themselves within minutes. Versus, if this is acute occlusion, then these changes are going to persist. So, if you are trying to differentiate, do you have ischemia that caused an arrhythmia, or are you having an arrhythmia that's causing ischemia, then the key is gonna be in, if I fix the rhythm problem, does it go away within minutes? And that's how you're going to differentiate the two. The other interesting thing about this is that the amount of ST elevation in AVR correlates directly with mortality. So the uglier the EKG looks, the worse off the patient is. And I believe that's it. Questions? Mind's blown? This may have gone too far, of course, so that's fine. I'm just curious. But how does the trope values match that when you've done the intervention? Like, we always see just the, 
the very right. initial effect, right? Would yes. Be, uh, you know, but then if there is any intervention, I, I kind of wonder how the troponin levels match that. So if that damage has occurred, yes. and then enzymes are released, and then, you know, would that potentially cause it to still trend upwards for a while? Yes. Like we expect that to happen. We've yes. done the intervention. Yes. Well, what does that look like then? I mean, somebody's had an intervention and they come back to the emergency room because they're having other symptoms, let's say. So you mean like a How patient? How do we differentiate between a troponin that's trending upwards because of an injury that's already happened mm -hmm. and a troponin that's trending upwards because of an, an injury that's happening now, like a new or a worse new injury? So you're, if someone has a very recent infarct um, and their troponin is still high or trending down from that recent infarct, um, I believe you're actually going to look at the CK because the CK changes faster. Um, so, MB? Yeah, yes, you can be. I, I think. I knew that once for a cardiology test, but I'm not 100% sure. But, <laughs> so, but I'm 99% sure it's CKMB. Um, that uh, is, so if you have high trope, low CK, then it's because you have like trending downward mm -hmm. infarct versus if you have high trope, high CK, it's because of, some, of something acute, I believe. So in the scenario here, we're talking about where we just do the intervention and then we kind of expect to see that little bit of change after because of that insult to the, car, the heart. We've had that ischemia for X mm -hmm. amount of time due to the heart rate or filling. So odds are that um, by the time that they're, so if they come in through the ED, they send them up to the cath lab, and then they're on CCU for, until they get discharged for a couple days or whatever, their troponin is going to be normal by the time they're discharged. So by the time that they bounce back to the ED for a stent reocclusion or whatever, then you would be looking again for like acute changes in the troponin or something else. Because um, I think, yeah, I, I'm, Pretty sure their trope is going to be normal by the time they're discharged, um, but if not, then CK and B would be the differentiator, I believe. Um, but there also will be EKG changes. So um, one thing to look out for um, with patients that have recent stent placement would be uh, non-compliance with like the clopidogrel or whatever they're supposed to be on, um, because that can easily lead to um, thrombus in the stent. And it doesn't, it happens relatively infrequently now that they're using drug eluting stents all the time, but it still does happen. So if someone came to the ED, had an MI, got a stent placement, comes back next week, and they're saying, this is chest pain exactly like when I was having my STEMI last week, and their EKG looks exactly like their STEMI last week, then that's probably a reocclusion of the stent in the exact same place. Um, so their, their EKG will also normalize by the time that they're discharged. So you can compare to their previous EKG, that they, to their discharge EKG, basically. Because CCU patients, they're going to get a, a morning routine EKG every day, basically. Um, and so once that artery is opened, you're going to see the ST elevation is going to go away. They're going to have like a reperfusion T waves and some other changes. But um, ST elevation is basically almost, acute ST elevation is almost always going to represent acute occlusion. Uh, the main gotcha there um, would actually be if they have, so one of the other causes of uh, persistent ST elevation is left ventricular aneurysm. So if they've had an infarct and they have this big area of necrotic tissue that's, that's an aneurysmal in the LV, um, then that will cause persistent ST elevation. And there, are, um, there is a mathematical formula for differentiating between acute LAD occlusion and uh, left ventricular aneurysm, which I won't get into, but it's published by the same guy that did the proportional uh, left funnel branch criteria. Um, so that's potentially another cause of uh, ST elevation in someone with a recent infarct. We'll send them to Revenon. Yeah, exactly. You're like, blah, 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 cath lab. Great. <laughs> <laughs>